Good morning, everyone. Uh, for today's edition of the Leadership Series, our guest speaker from the field of finance is Mr. Nachiket Moore. Mr. Moore is a former Deputy Managing Director of the ICICI Bank, and he then headed the ICICI Foundation for Inclusive Growth, which is a non-profit institution. He now works on several philanthropic initiatives in rural India, dealing with healthcare, infrastructure, and microfinance. Mr. Moore was born in Mumbai and has an undergraduate degree in physics from the Mumbai University. He also holds a master's degree in management from the Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad, and a PhD, uh, and a PhD in economics from the University of Pennsylvania, with a specialization in finance from the Wharton School. <coughs> Mr. Moore joined ICICI in 1987 and was a member of the board from 2001 to 2007. He was the former deputy managing director of the bank and earned a reputation as a financial services expert. After an early retirement, he assisted ICICI in setting up a philanthropic foundation, the ICICI Foundation for Inclusive Growth, and served as its founding president. Mr. Moore is now the chairman of the boards of Suga Vasbu Healthcare, Care India, and IFMR Trust, and he is closely involved in the evolution of these three organizations in India. Suga Vasbu, which means happy life in Tamil, and Care India, are both organizations that work to streamline primary health care in rural areas with technology. He is also a member of several central government committees that deal with infrastructure and health care, and he has been selected to head a committee for studying financial inclusion by the RBI. For his pioneering efforts, Mr. Nachiket Moore was awarded the Crossover Leader Award at the Forbes India Philanthropy Awards in 2012, and he was named a Yale World Fellow in recognition of his achievements. I would now like to invite Mr. Moore on stage to share his journey with us. Thank you very much, uh, Ishan, for that uh, very generous introduction. It's a real pleasure to be talking to you all. Uh, and I want to thank Ishan for taking the trouble to invite me to the school. It's not often, as I was telling him earlier, that I get invited to talk to such a smart group of young people. <coughs> And whenever I've had the opportunity, and this is by far the youngest group that I've had the opportunity to talk to, uh, I've always enjoyed it. The topic he gave me uh, was to talk about my personal journey, uh, with the hope that there will be some parts of it that will be interesting to some of you. Well, I'm happy to do this, but I want to warn you ahead of time that it's a meandering one, and it's entirely possible that it will tell you more about what not to do instead of providing you with some guideposts. I grew up actually in a city in Maharashtra called Nagpur and my parents shipped me off to a school called Rishi Valley in Andhra Pradesh at the age of 11. As a result, by the time I got to your age, I had pretty much gotten used to taking all of my own decisions about what I wanted to do entirely on my own. Perhaps not surprisingly therefore, I emerged from the cocoon of my lovely school entirely and completely confused about my next steps. I decided because I didn't know what, I, what else to uh, do, that I would take a year off from studies and travel around the country with the hope some, that some clarity would emerge at the end of that uh, one year journey. My parents naturally were very reluctant, but they agreed to let me go. And I spent a whole year visiting some pretty remote places in India. And even after all these years, and that this was many years ago, uh, as you can tell, uh, I have actually some wonderful war stories to tell. Uh, I was an 18-year-old boy, travelling entirely alone, had lived a sheltered life, not even in a city, actually in a boarding school. Uh, had very little money in my pocket because I insisted I would manage with the pocket money that I had saved. But for the weeks and months that I was on the road, not once, you know, it may sound amazing to you, was I cheated or robbed. I was in fact met uniformly with kindness and with concern. You know, one story I will tell you. I was once trying to hitch a ride in that year from one Rajasthani city to another. I, because you know I didn't have that much money, so I was doing you know free riding as much as I could. So I started early afternoon to look for a, somebody that would take me where I wanted to go. It was quite far. But it was only, it was late evening by the time I actually somebody agreed uh, to, to take me there. I found a truck that was willing to, was bound for my destination. Halfway, must have been around midnight because it was a long journey. Uh, our truck was suddenly surrounded by police cars with loudly wailing sirens. I discovered that I had inadvertently hitched a ride with drug smugglers. 
because Rajasthan, as you know, is a part of that border in which there is a fair amount of drug smuggling going on. When we stopped, the truck, the driver pointed to me and said that, you know, he has nothing to do with us. And the police let me get off from the truck. And then the truck and the police, they left. I was dropped literally in the middle of nowhere. It was so dark that I could not see my hand. And I could not tell, was I in the middle of the road or was I on one side of the road? So I did the only thing I could think of, just put my little suitcase down and sit on top of it and wait for the morning to dawn because I could at least feel my suitcase and I knew where it was. After what seemed like eons, the truck showed up again and asked me to get back in to continue my journey and inform me that they had settled the matter with the police. <laughs> they had no reason to return. They could have just left me there to continue the journey and these were not the nicest of people. But you know, I didn't. They didn't decide to just dump me and, and push off somewhere else. I was actually quite pleased and quite relieved, frankly, that they had decided to come back. But at the end of the year, while that year was very valuable, from an academic perspective, it didn't actually provide me a lot of clarity as to what I wanted. Since physics was closest to the subject that I seemed to like and I had some ability, I decided that I would pursue a bachelor's degree in physics at Bombay University, as Ishan pointed out. And I, I said that, you know, at the end of that three-year period, if I felt the same way about physics, I would continue uh, with physics. And this is how I ended up in the big bad city of Bombay. And I must say, while I had studied in England for a while as an exchange student, and I had visited the city of London, arriving in Bombay was a huge, big shock. I stayed in a hostel, made some very, very good friends, and sure enough, I started to meet the physics nerd types. I'm sure some of you are sitting in the audience here. <laughs> and I, I discovered that I did not have quite the passion for physics that I thought originally I had when I started uh, you know, thinking about it. But while living there, I developed a deep and eventually lasting interest in the problems of poverty and development. And, 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 and I felt that this may be an area that I wanted to focus on uh, for my future. So I decided, while I was in college, to explore this area further and started to volunteer with NGOs on a part-time during my academic year and full-time uh, during my summer breaks to learn more about it. Through these three years of very good experiences in different places with extremely left-wing Maoist-type NGOs, extremely right-wing NGOs that only be, believe in economic development and don't worry about rights and such like, <laughs> I, 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 I thought that, that that work, you know, I, I felt an affinity with it. But I also realized there is yet another warm body, somebody with a lot of passion. I was not really contributing to much, much to the scene. And I really needed to get some skills in order to be useful if I wanted to work in this area. And obviously, since an undergraduate degree in physics was not exactly the right preparation for doing development work, after talking to many, many people, thinking about a field like the IAS, for example, that you might think about later on in your careers, I felt it was not such a good for me. And I would get a more general degree called an MBA and that would be a much better preparation. Now the entrance exam to the MBA program, many of you have already given, I would imagine, your exams, uh, was my first real exposure to serious competition. Until now, I had been in a very, very sheltered environment. And Bombay, being Bombay, I realized, when I started to think about how to prepare, I had to sit for an entrance exam to get into a coaching class for the entrance exam. <laughs> I had discovered pretty early in life that I was no genius and had the added problems of very limited attention span, very poor ability to remember things, and a very restless temperament. So I developed a coping strategy which was set a daily pattern with a lot of variety. I couldn't do one thing for more than an hour, uh, but a pattern that I simply had to follow. For the MBA entrance exam, I somehow got into the coaching class, but discovered very quickly that I had a real uphill climb. My first day, they gave us a math test. I found that the person sitting next to me, it was 25 questions. He had finished the 25 question exam in less than half the time allotted for it. In the entire time, I had finished half the exam and gotten half those answers wrong. I was tempted to give up right then and there. And, but since that was not really a choice, because if I gave up that, what was I going to do? I spent a lot of time trying to decide that this is what I was going to do. So I decided to put my old, you know, this pattern that I spoke about a little bit earlier into action. And in the six months that I had to prepare, because that first class was a real shock to me, and I realized that if I didn't, you know, get it together, I wouldn't make it. 
I solved every single problem set I could find. I would go to, I don't know, those of you go to Flora Fountain, you'll see all these second-hand booksellers. And they will sell you all these old books for preparing for exams. I buy every one of them and solve every single one of them. And then I did a full-length admissions exam every single Sunday. You know, you can imagine how many Sundays that was. Uh, and made sure that in the three hours, the four hours that I had, uh, I was able to, you know, drill this stuff much better. And gradually, I got better uh, at, at doing those, you know, 25 question tests. I wasn't that bad as it was right away. Fortunately for me, that strategy worked out. And I was able to squeak in to I am the bar. Um, and then using the same approach, I finished near the top of my class. Uh, but again, to do that, while a lot of my classmates watched every TV program, went to every restaurant that they could find in the city of Ahmedabad, I did nothing else. Because I knew that if I, without the natural talents that some of my classmates had, if I slacked off, I would simply drop off the map. Perhaps because I had come from a boarding school background and I had very early developed an independent streak, I became one of those people who, despite being very confused, choose a direction and then set off in that direction in a dogged manner no matter what everybody else around them is doing. So while everybody else in my batch was joining very highly rated private sector and international companies, given my interest in development, I did my summer training with an NGO, I was an MP, and then decided to take a job with ICICI, which was then a government-owned development finance institution, and paid a princely salary of 1,500 rupees a month. Having come from a modest background, and with my elder brother always around to support me in every way, I didn't worry about money as much. And my early years at ICICI were just amazing. I met some wonderful people, had the good fortune of having stalwarts. Some of you may have heard these names, some of you may not have, we may hear them later, like Mr. Kamat, Mr. Bagul, Mrs. Morparia. They provided me great mentorship. And I discovered that my approach towards work worked even better in working environments. And I had, you know, uh, you can tell I had never really gotten a chance to develop uh, you know, any social skills. Uh, and all I did, literally 24 hours a day in, in, the, in the work, in, in ICICI, was work. Uh, I had only studied all my life until then. I had never worked before. I really enjoyed what I was doing. And then quickly, after a few years, I discovered that even though I had a fancy MBA degree, I was one of the top students, I didn't really have the skills that was needed to do a good job of the tasks that were assigned to me. And I see I being public sector told me we don't have any money to pray for fancy training programs. Fortunately, I was able to get several scholarships and uh, to, to pay for my education. And then instead of doing a three-month training program, I thought, let me go the full distance. And I got a PhD in finance at the Wharton School, which is part of the University of Pennsylvania. By now, you can guess that my motto in life had become that I had to become a real expert in something if I wanted to do it well. And perhaps, you know, because of my PhD, my early background in physics, my inability to remember anything, for me, unless I understood something really, really well, I just could not remember it. And I could not use it in actual work. But unexpectedly, because of this limitation, and because of my need to keep poking at something again and again in order to register, I gradually started to build the capability of linking apparently unconnected, seeing patterns where most people saw just disconnected facts. Uh, and I became gradually somebody that was very good at solving completely new problems, thinking about ideas from scratch. You know, typically where I would get used most in my work was when people were building a new business and they had no idea what this business would look like. Right? But somebody like me, who was, you know, would poke at it and poke at it and didn't have any special talents, would actually, it turned, it turned out, was able to do this much better. While I was getting my PhD, I worked with a Philadelphia-based hedge fund called Quantitative Financial Strategies, so that I could round out my academic training with some real-world financial markets experience. That firm hired only PhDs and gave me an opportunity to understand how markets work in the US and apply a great deal of what I was learning in my PhD in a real-life environment. And given my strong desire to return to India, to put to use all that I had learned during my stint in the US, I came right back to ICICI after finishing my PhD. And that was a golden period for India in many ways. With the combination of a rapidly changing environment, wonderful mentors that I've mentioned already at ICICI, 
and the benefit of the training that I had received in the US, the next 10 years were absolutely fabulous for me. I had built a part of ICICI Bank. We went from being a tiny bank with about 300 people to a bank that is today 300,000 people. I became from a bank that nobody had heard about to the second largest bank in the country. Played a role in building derivatives markets in India. My speciality, my academic speciality and my work speciality was in foreign exchange derivatives. Uh, and th that was a market that was just coming up uh, in the country. Helped build the microfinance movement in India and was closely involved in a variety of social sector activities. And you know, I'd be happy to talk about that in q and I joined the board of a company called Wipro in 1996 and the board of ICICI Bank in 2001 as one of the youngest ever directors. I also chaired the Fixed Income Money Market and Derivatives Association and helped take the fixed income markets. You may not know what fixed income markets are, but you know, just to give you a sense that you know, this was something that I got involved in uh, uh, over a period of time. 2004, about 10, 15 years after I had long time in ICICI, I got an opportunity to be a student again at Yale University as a world fellow, and which gave me an opportunity to reflect on what I wanted to do next. I spent about six months there. In fact, all of us in the family uh, went there. You know, this was one of those programs. They choose one person from every part of the world, and, and they ask to spend about a few months at the university. You know, after that experience, after a few more years at ICICI, I felt that you know I had to move on to pursue new challenges. I had gotten you know kind of stale in this, and I, I you know I, I wasn't looking forward to my work anymore. Uh, and, and I thought let me focus, move from ICICI to focus much more sharply on where I felt more work needed to be done, and where I felt I could do something new and have an impact. One was the whole issue of you know making sure that everybody has access to banking services. Uh, and we can talk more about that. Uh, the other was in the area of healthcare. Uh, in the years since leaving ICICI, I have built organizations such as Fino. You would not have heard about it, I'm sure. It's the largest digital payments company in the country today. It serves 70 million households uh, and provides a lot of electronic payments uh, to them. And a company called IFMA Trust, which is building right now six, eventually they hope to build hundreds of small banks that actually work in remote rural areas and we approach banking in a, in, in a very different way. Both these organizations are doing well now, and uh, uh, you know, I'm pursuing my interest in finance uh, as a board member of the Reserve Bank of India, uh, <clears throat> and, and you know, focusing a lot more on the policy areas. Healthcare is turning into my new passion, and it's, a, it's an area where I'm hoping to start again as a student and build a completely new career. Uh, I chair the board of directors of Care India, it's a large NGO uh, that works, it's, it actually was, is headquartered in Atlanta uh, overall. Uh, I was a board member there. And then the Indian entity is spun off into a separate legal uh, organization, and I chair that organization. Uh, we work in states like Odisha, Bihar, West Bengal, uh, working on trying to improve healthcare in these very poor states. I also help create a new organization uh, in the South that does more fundamental design. As you know, I pointed out earlier, I'm actually best in a situation where I'm given a clean sheet of paper and asked to think about how to, how to come up with a new idea from scratch. Um, and as I mentioned to you earlier, I'm one of those people that likes to acquire deep expertise uh, and, and want to now study further, you might find it surprising at my age, in the field of healthcare. Many of you must be giving admissions exams and you'll be surprised to know that even I had to give an uh, exam called the GRE. And I had to turn to my son, 16-year-old son, to help me remember all the area calculations and how to figure out triangle and square and all of that. Uh, I have now admission to, the, uh, to Harvard University uh, to do a master's program in public health. Uh, but, you know, I, I had it last year as well. But I, I'm not sure I'll be able to go, even though I'm actually very keen uh, to continue uh, to acquire some expertise in this area. As you may have gathered by now, I didn't really have a very planned thing. But what I found is, as long as I was willing to put in the time and get deep into the subject at hand, not only did it turn out to be more interesting than I had originally thought, but the fact that I was not especially brilliant did not actually prove to be a handicap. And I am Ahmedabad, for example, it would take me hours and hours to understand things that my writer classmates understood in a minute. But because I stuck to it, I eventually caught up and gradually started to build some of the new capabilities that I mentioned earlier. But in contrast to that, all my life, I've been a great believer in not making up my mind too quickly. 
uh, meandering, doing this, doing that, taking time off. You know, the number of times I've taken a year off, six months off, uh, to do something completely different, much against the wishes of my parents, my friends, my bosses. I took four years off to do a PhD. People said your career will suffer heavily because, you know, four years nobody will hear about you. You know, but my instinct was let me do what I think, you know, works out very well. I really enjoyed volunteering, for example, as an opportunity to get to know uh, organizations really intimately, get to know the work uh, really well. And then once I decide what I want to do, I worry less about, am I good at this? I really much more worry about, does it interest me? Is it exciting? And then I, I found that you know, by putting in the hours, you can actually become really good at, at, at something else. I don't know if the story or approach holds any lessons for you or sparks off any ideas in your mind, but I want to wish you all all the very best for the future. Knowing your school, knowing some of you, I'm very sure that you will do very well. The key question that I feel you'll have to constantly ask yourselves is what will you do with all this talent that you have, that it makes you happy, but also works to make the world a little bit of a better place. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> I don't think you would ever come across such a true lifelong learner, an embodiment of the IB learner program. <laughs> Mr. Morgan, thank you. You have had a fascinating life. And I think, excuse me, the point that I would take from what you said this morning was the need 